So have you ever done something that is contrary to your character? Have you ever done anything that even surprised you in the moment? It's like, where did that come from? Said something, said an offhand joke, maybe in response to uh, something someone else did, you just reacted, and you're like, oh, where did that come from? That is not who I am. Please forgive me. Has that ever happened to you? It seems to be a pretty universal human experience uh, when we don't represent ourselves well or represent what we hope <laughs> to be. And I just want to say this morning that it's okay to be human. Nothing about becoming a Christian stops you from being fully human. And that's why we need grace. And that's why we need to serve a God who is unchanging. We are in the journey, in the process of becoming like him, but we are not yet him. Nor will we ever actually be him, right? We're never going to become God, but we are supposed to represent God to the world. We're image bearers. We are made in his image to represent him to the world by the way we love and care and steward for creation. And the more closely we represent him, the more faithfully, consistently, reliably we represent him, the more people see his glory through us. But I just want to say up front as we get into this message about God's faithfulness that as we strive, as we desire to become more and more faithful like God, that we need to understand we need grace on this journey. We need grace <laughs> from God directly to us. And then here's the next thing, church. We need to give each other grace. Okay, because sometimes there is no greater disappointment than when we let one another down. It, it, we expect to be let down by people, you know, at work and at Walmart or, or wherever we go. We just expect that. We expect to be disappointed. We expect that someone is going to act inconsistent uh, or unreliably. But it hurts when it's your family. It hurts when it's your spouse. It hurts when it's your brother or sister. It hurts when it's someone that you go to church with because we have higher expectations for those closest to us. And so in some ways, we just need to be realistic about that and acknowledge that, that we're actually setting ourselves up for that heartache <laughs> by our unrealistic ex expectations for people who go to church to be of anything other than human, okay? So you're setting yourself up for failure by the way you set expectations. That's just true. We do that in marriage. We do that in relationships, you know. <laughs> That's inappropriate. Okay, so I'm not going to use that illustration. There are so many ways we set ourselves up for, uh, for failure in this way. I, the illustration that came to my mind was marriage, you know. <laughs> It's just you have, it's called, when I do premarital counseling, it's called idealistic distortion. There's a whole category in, the, in this tool I use for premarital counseling that demonstrates how couples look at each other in ways that is distorted. Uh, like this person's breath is not going to smell in the morning. Oh yeah, it is. You know, this person will never do anything that will ever disappoint me. Yeah, they are. This person will never do anything that would, could cause me to, to, to change my love for them. Oh, yeah, they could. <laughs> but when we're in that process of that new love, that idealistic thing, we think, oh, this person would never do that. This person is just that. I wouldn't marry him if they're capable of doing such things, you know. But here's the good news, and let me get to the point because I want to get into the sermon is that God, you cannot idealistically distort God because God is perfect. You can do that with me, and trust me, if you have any high expectations of me other than what you would expect of a clerk at, at Walmart, then you probably are going to be disappointed by me, okay? You know, the reality is, is, is that we are human. God is not. Okay, that's the sermon. But, but no, seriously, if you can get that through your head, you will have an emotionally a much more, um, how do I say this in proper English? You'll, your EQ, your emotional intelligence will be higher. I don't know if you ever heard that term, EQ, emotional intelligence. A lot of times in the world we think if you have a high IQ, then you can do anything. Let me tell you, I know some really smart people who cannot relate to another human being, therefore they have no, it's just, it doesn't matter how smart they are. 
for you to have a higher emotional intelligence, you need a higher spiritual intelligence because you have to have a right view of God, a right view of yourself, and a right view of people. So in this sermon, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give us a right view of God. God is faithful. What does that mean? And then immediately, very quickly, we're going to then look at how does that then apply to how I view myself and how I interact with the world. Okay, so let's do it. Thank God that unlike us, God does not err in his faithfulness. God does not um, have a knee-jerk response that doesn't reflect his character. You can't surprise God into doing something that is wrong or imperfect or, or not good. God will always act according to his character. God is faithful. And so we're going to look at the fact that God is faithful. In the Hebrew word, we're going to look at Lamentations. If you want to get there, it might table of contents is your friend when I say books like Lamentations. Okay, the book of Lamentations written by Jeremiah in the Old Testament. Use your table of contents. <laughs> we're going to look at Lamentations chapter 3, verses 19 to 27. But let me just say this. When we're looking at faithfulness, we're going to look at the Hebrew word hesed. Hesed is a famous word uh, in the Jewish tradition. It is an important word in our Old Testament. It's an important word in understanding God and who God is. It's the Hebrew word hesed. Okay, can we say that? Hesed. It's not that hard. It's not one of those ones that you, go, ah, you don't have to get too deep in your throat. So what that word means is God's covenant faithfulness. God is faithful to his covenant. That is a great way to understand that word. In Lamentations 3, which we're about to look at, it's translated his loving kindness. His loving kindness. So, God's activity of faithfulness flows out of the center of who he is. God is not trying to be faithful to you. Many men I know, when they talk to me about marriage, they say, man, I'm really trying hard to be faithful to my wife. They have to try hard to be faithful to their wife because it doesn't come out of the center of who they are. Because we're human. We struggle with faithfulness because ultimately we see the world through our own lenses and we want what we want and we want it now. And when you're egocentric by nature, it's hard to be faithful to another person because you want what you want before you want what's best for them. Therefore, you, what we struggle with as human beings is putting our own interest before the interest of another. What love is, biblically, is the ability to put their interest before your own, to love them with agape, a covenant faithful love, hesed, a love that's always in the best interest of the other, regardless of how it may impact you. And if we're honest with ourselves, that does not come naturally to us, okay? So we have to do things like put filters on computers and on phones and not have certain relationships with certain people from work because they, they might be a temptation or we might not be able to go to certain locations or hang out with certain crowds of people in order to be faithful because with God, faithfulness flows out of the center of who he is. He doesn't have to try to be faithful. He just is. He's not tempted to be anything but what he is because he's God. He's perfect. So therefore, God is truthful to his covenant promises. And so why do we teach the promises of God? It's because you can take him to the bank. Every promise of God comes out of the center of who God is, and God never goes against his word. He never goes against his nature. God is faithful in every dealing of justice and mercy. It is impossible for God to not act in accordance with his own character. For God to not be faithful to all of his promises is for God to cease being. And that is just like a nonsense statement. How can God, who has always been and always will be, cease being? But to think of God not being faithful to his promises is, is to think of there not being a God. Okay, philosophy class over. Let's now look at the text. Lamentations 3, verses 19 to 27. And I could just read this whole chapter to you. It's, the whole chapter is beautiful, but we have time restraints. And we also have attention span issues. So let's focus. Remember my affliction and my wanderings. Remember, this is Jeremiah the prophet talking, and Lamentations was written 
uh, after the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. So it's a long time ago, you know, 2,600 years ago and change, you know, or so. And so it's a very old book, ancient, uh, and it was written at a time when the capital of Israel had been destroyed by Babylon, and after successive waves of deportation, uh, basically all the intellectual elites, all the ruling class, everybody who was anybody was taken out of Jerusalem. There was a special dispensation given to, to Jeremiah to stay. Um, that's a whole different story. But the reality is here's Jeremiah in a destroyed capital city, the, the center of the religious identity of the Jewish people, and he is writing this book as he, as he views the destruction of his people. With that said, here we go. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it. In other words, he can't stop being caught up in all this mess. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this, I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. So Jeremiah was in a situation much worse than COVID. Agreed? Can we agree to that? I know that's hard for us to imagine because this is our little world and that's his world 25 plus hundred years ago. But this was a bad, bad situation. Complete decimation of a people. Deportation, gone. Northern 10 tribes of Israel have been destroyed about 140 years prior by Assyria, the Assyrian Empire. Now we're here with Babylon completely decimating this nation. He's, in, he's actually literally in the rubble of Washington, D.C., it's not just tearing down a couple statues. It's like everything is leveled. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Can you say that no matter what your circumstances are? His mercies never come to an end, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Aren't you glad Pastor Ken leads us in worship and not me? They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who keeps him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. And I could keep going. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. That's here in the ESV, in the New American Standard. It's translated loving kindnesses. This is what we're talking about today. This is what I want you to hang on to because right here there's a couple points I want to make how are we going to live in response to God's faithfulness to God's hesed to God's loving kindness okay because as no matter what you're going through we can look to Jeremiah and see this situation where he was in the worst possible case situation for his nation the worst possible situation for his religion the worst possible situation for him personally and yet, what did he do? He declared the character of God, the promises of God, not just for himself, but for his people. And I think that's what we need to do, church, is we need to be the people that aren't caught up in the crisis, but are the people that are caught up in the God of the crisis, that reflect his glory by the way we love, care, and steward this situation. So let's look at how we do that. First, first point you can write this down or you can uh, text it to yourself we are to hope in him that's it it's your first thing that you have to do we are to hope in him the only way we will hope in god is when we believe 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 is not just an intellectual faith it's not just a shoulders up faith believe is your head your heart your hands and your feet it's your whole life i believe this to be true therefore i live according to it the only way we can have hope in this god who is faithful is if we believe he is who he says he is and he'll do what he says he will do 
If you don't believe God is who he says he is and he will do what he says he will do, then you have no hope, even if you go to church. Because we need hope that's not just sufficient. We need hope that perseveres. We need a hope that is uh, uh, unrelenting inside your mind and your heart. A hope that won't let you go. When you're hit and you're down and you see stars, I want you to think of God in that moment. Psalm 130, verse 7, connects hope with God's hesed. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is loving kindness, and with him is abundant redemption. Don't you love that? We can hope in the Lord, we can hope in his hesed, his loving kindness, because in God there is abundant redemption. Do you know when Jesus is used the word, uses the word abundant? It's in John 10.10. 10. And he says, the thief, the destroyer, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come to give you the abundant life. So we see all the way back in the psalmist, which was written a thousand years before Jesus, a 3,000-year-old poem here, pointing to Jesus, that in God, in his loving kindness, in his covenant faithfulness, he has abundant redemption. Do you believe that? He's not just going to redeem you back to here. He's going to redeem you overflowing. He's going to overflow your cup in the crisis. Okay, Psalm 4610. I love this. This is one of my favorite Psalms. This teaches us to not only, this teaches us not to put hope in our own efforts. And I, I'm, I'm a bit of a type A goals-oriented worker, and so I need this. I'm a driver, and it's only by the Holy Spirit's restraint of me that I don't drive, that I don't push too hard on people. And, and so here it is. Cease striving. This is Psalm 46.10. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. God is going to do it. He doesn't need my help. God is going to exalt his name. You cease striving. Be still. Know that he is God. Have hope in him because he's going to take care of it. When we think we have to put our hands to everything to fix it, then we are not hoping. We'll get to activity here in a little bit, but brothers and sisters, friends, please hear me. When your anxious, anxious response to crisis is to get in there and fix it, there's a good chance you're just part of the problem. When you can't listen to your spouse long enough to hear their heart and reflect back to them what they're saying before you jump in with your defensiveness, and your anxiety, and you trying to fix your spouse, then you're not actually loving your spouse because you care more about your response to your spouse than caring about hearing their heart and what they're saying. So men, because we're the ones who struggle with this the most, but ladies, I know you do too, actually listen to your, to listen to your, your spouse. Actually hear what they're saying before you get defensive and try to fix them. You might actually tell them that you love them by the way you listen to them instead of just getting quick to your point. We have to be good listeners. Are you a good listener to God? See, striving. You get triggered in your anxiety and fear about something, and you get right into work because you think you got to fix it. You're not see, striving. You're working out anxiety and fear. Take a step back. Pray. Let God fill you with his peace and his comfort and then move in activity because your activity now is filled with the spirit and not with your anxiety and there's a difference between your human spirit and the holy spirit one is driven by your ego and your need to be successful and make life work for you the other one is fueled by god whose desire is for his will to be done on earth big difference (laughs) it's your choice Every time something happens, it's your choice. In that moment, it's your choice. You're either going to cease striving, center yourself on God, wait upon him, and then act according to his will, or you're just going to get on it. You'll get what you get. And that moves us directly to our second point. We are first to hope in him, okay? So we've got to believe that he is who he says he is and that he will do that which he says he will do. If I don't believe that, I will never take a moment, take a deep breath, count to 10 instead of giving that angry word or that angry response or telling that that bad joke or whatever it may be that your tended, whatever your tendencies are. Second thing is we wait. We are to wait for God. And hang with me. I'm not talking about passivity here. Hang in there. 
Those who believe in him can find hope in him. Therefore, we wait for his abundant salvation. We wait for him to deliver us. We wait for him to rescue us. Jeremiah stated right here in this Lamentations text, it is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. It is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. You know what my favorite verse on waiting is? Because I love eagles. It's Isaiah 40, verse 31. I have a big painting of this in my office above my desk. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. It's a promise. But the promise is for those who wait upon the Lord. That those who believe he is who he says he is, for those who believe he will do that which he says he will do, and they will wait upon him. If you let your anxiety and fear over life drive you, you will become weary and heavy burdened. You'll be crushed by the weight of expectations that you put on yourself to be your own savior. Because that's exactly what you're doing. When you run ahead of a situation because you feel like you have to fix it, and this doesn't need prayer because I just know what I need to do. I'm gonna get on this. You're acting like a savior. You're acting like abundant salvation, abundant redemption of this situation comes through me. When all I'm asking you to do is to pause, to wait upon the Lord and say, God, bring your abundant redemption to this moment. Bring your power in this moment. And just right there in that 10 second prayer, everything changes because you've now invited the God of the universe who has a perfect plan you have invited him to come in and to be a part of it and that changes everything and that's not just some kind of mental thing we do that's not some kind of self-talk therapy this is you connecting and abiding with the greatest power source of the universe who promises abundant salvation wait upon the lord and he will multiply the works of your hands those who those who Labor to build the house without the Lord, labor in vain. Psalm 131, verses 1 to 3. I love this. Okay, this scripture right here, I believe, will change your life. This scripture right here has changed my life. And I don't say that about every scripture, although I'd say it about a lot of them, because the, the Bible has changed my life. <laughs> Psalm 131, verses 1 to 3. I want you to hear this. Listen to this. <laughs> and man, we need this today. Americans, we need this. Oh, Lord. My heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul like a weaned child rest against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. O oh Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. I want to read that first part for you. O oh Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. That has changed my life. And I think that could change social media. And I think that could change our nation. I think this is a key verse for personal well-being and mental health. I have composed and quieted my soul because I do not involve myself. I do not involve myself in great matters, things that are too difficult for me. I stay in my lane. <laughs> I don't drive erratic. <laughs> I stay in my lane. I don't cut people off on the road. I stay in my lane. And that makes sense, driving physically down the road. But man, in social media world and in conversational world, people are cutting each other off left and right, getting out of their lane. Oh, I dream of a day where people would stay in their lane. You expect it on the highways. Why don't we expect it in everyday life? Pride. This is the great malady of all ages. But right now in the age of technology, we have this pride in the abundance of information that has caused many of us to involve ourselves in matters that are too difficult for us when God, you know what all God asks you to do is give a glass of cool water to your neighbor. All God's asking you to do is love your neighbor as yourself. All God is asking you to do 
is just declare his witness and his love, his gospel goodness, his grace to show forgiveness. Man, if we could just get that right. We get so highfalutin in our thoughts and so overstressed about things that are beyond our pay grades, beyond mine, beyond so many of ours. You might be one of those people involved in the issues. That's great. If you're called to be in that issue, go be in that issue. Whatever that issue may be. Like for me, my issue is soul care. My issue is, is your spiritual well-being. My issue is your faith with Jesus. And you know, so I'm probably not going to talk about many other issues with much authority because that's not my place. But how your spiritual vitality affects your emotional well-being, your relational well-being, your life vitality, the way you work, the way you do marriage, the way you do... Man, I am your subject matter expert. I'm in my lane, and I'm going to speak with boldness and with accuracy. You start asking about educational policies and, and community health policies, and like that, I'm like, listen, I'm going to partner with the people who are in that lane. I, am, I, I do not have the education or the training. But we don't live in an age where people are subject matter experts. We live in an age where all people are e on an equal playing field. Therefore, someone's opinion is the same as anyone else's opinion the great pride of the information age to the destruction of all of us. And we're getting what we're getting as a society. Chaos. Anarchy. Could you really work hard at loving your family and making that your most important thing you do all day? Or being faithful to that which you're called to do at work? Or maybe you're in school being really good at that subject or what you're studying at school or sports, being really good at that. You have been strategically put into a neighborhood by God. You thought you chose your house. Well, you did, but God also put you there. You can figure that one out later. But would you be a really good neighbor to those people? And I'm feeling conviction too. But sometimes we actually abdicate our responsibilities to God's calling upon our life by worrying about things that are way outside our ability to influence or change. And we don't invest our emotions and our energy in the things that we can change. Like the way we treat our children or our parents, or the way we treat our, our friends and our family. And we let everything else make us hot and bothered, worried about everything like Martha. And then we're distracted at home. We're not focused. So I'm not calling for you to not be involved. I'm calling you for to be fully involved in things you're called to be involved with and let those who are called take care of the other things. And stop agitating this situation. Okay, we've stayed there long enough. Let's move in to Psalm 33, verses 11 to 22. I love this psalm. This psalm moves us toward a deeper understanding of how we should respond to God's covenant faithfulness. Listen to Psalm 33, verses 11 to 22. I'm doing a lot of work in the Psalter today because I believe that just the promises of God are so rich in the book of Psalms. So Psalm 33, verses 11 to 22. Oh, it's a great passage. I'm just going to read it. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. In by its great might, it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his hesed, on his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him, because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Man, there's so much truth in there that we need to hear as a people. The biblical mindset of waiting on the Lord is not passive. And you hear this in the Lamentations text. Jeremiah forms a couplet. 
The Lord is good though to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. So the person who waits on him is the person who seeks him. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a couplet uh, in the way the Hebrews wrote. Okay, so that's the third point. We're not just to hope in God, and we're not just to wait on God. Remember, waiting is not passive. We're to seek him. So this is almost like point 2A and 2B. It's the same point. We're to wait upon him. You know, we're to cease striving and know that he is God. We're to stay in our lane and let him fill us with his promises and with his truths so that we work within the area of his call upon our lives, and we're to seek him. Let's look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the man who wrote the book of Lamentations, also <laughs> is the one who wrote Jeremiah. And Jeremiah wrote this to those who had been taken into captivity, into Babylon, where they would be exiles for 70 years. 70 years taken out of Jerusalem into Babylon, which means they'd be waiting on God to show up with his promised deliverance, his abundant redemption for three generations. So when you hear this classic scripture I'm about to read to you, hear it in that context. Jeremiah is writing to a people who have seen their nation absolutely decimated by a foreign power. They have seen their capital city, the center of their religion, destroyed. And he is writing to them while they're in captivity, where they're going to be for 70 years, three generations. So those parents and grandparents are going to be dead before they even see this promise fulfilled. It's because the Hebrews did not have an individualistic focus. They had a communal focus. It's very un-American. We think very individualistically. Everything goes through the lens of me, myself, and I. Whereas the Bible is written through the lens of community. Generational views. So that right there can become a little bit misunderstanding because we'll start interpreting the promises through our cultural lens instead of reading them through the biblical lens. That, that's very disruptive to us. It's like a little, like a little, like I don't know. But can I apply it to myself? Absolutely, you can apply it to yourself. But remember, that's not how it was written, though. It wasn't written for me, myself, and I. It was written for us. We, a community of believers. But listen to this. That's beyond the point. Jeremiah 29, verses 4 to 13. So what does God say to his people while they're going to be in exile for 70 years? Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and become the fathers of sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear, your, that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city. Remember, he's writing to people who are living in Babylon. This is not their city. They've been deported to Moscow. Seek the welfare of Moscow. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare, you will have welfare. Now, welfare, once again, is not the American understanding of welfare. We're not talking about you being on welfare like here, a government program. He's talking about prosperity. He's talking about well-being. Okay, so once again, words, words matter. You hear welfare, you think some political thought probably or some socioeconomic thought. Um, when the, Bible, the word welfare is used in the Bible, it has nothing to do with that. It's like the word alien. The Bible does not talk about extraterrestrial creatures. Alien means foreigner, immigrant. It has more to do with immigration policy than it has to do with E.T. Okay, that's just an illustration. Uh, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will have welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you. In other words, don't let your local clergy people lie to you that everything's going to be hunky-dory and there's going to be no suffering and everything's going to be great. Okay? What the prophet of God is saying, do not let your prophets who are in your midst, your diviners, deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams which they dream, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them. Wow, that's a hard word, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. He's talking about back to Jerusalem, right? back to your home country, back to the center of religion, back to the center of your cultural identity. 
<laughs> and then here's your verse that you've memorized. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Here's the hardest thing about teaching the promises of God. All the promises of God are true, which means the blessings and the curses. And no one, especially in today's 21st century contemporary Western American culture, wants to hear about all the promises of God. They only want to hear about the good ones. <laughs> They're all good, because God is perfect. He's good. But we talk about what's good for me is good. That's not true. There's actually nothing ethically valid about that statement. <laughs> but that's the way we've been brainwashed to think. It's the way we've been indoctrinated to think, is that if it's good, then it's good for me. And, and that's, I'm sorry, man, that's just a horrible way to live. You're living in slavery if that's your understanding of good. Good, actually, the Greek word agathos, which is where we get the word good from, it's about God's goodness. It has nothing to do with whether it's good for you. Uh, it's about his character. So once again, goodness is what flows out of who he is. So to the point here, the key to the promises of God is that we need to respond to them faithfully. Okay? Which means that you can't interpret it through the lens of, is this going to be good for me? God, what if, I, what if I'm that 40-year-old? Um, so I'm 45, I'll be 46 soon. Okay, so my job is to raise my children and to make sure they get married off so that they raise their children so that they can get married off, so that they can have sons and daughters, so that they can return to the land. And the way I live before my children and the way I raise them and the way that uh, we then help them raise their children so that my grandchildren and great-grandchildren are raised so that they can then seek the Lord with their whole heart when they return to Jerusalem. And so even though I, in this older generation, may not see the reward of covenant faithful living, I will be faithful even if there's no feedback loop that blesses me directly. I will still be in captivity. I will still be in the hardship. I will still be in this situation, but I will remain faithful because God has promised that though that I can't see it, but who hopes in what they can see, right? So, so because I cannot see it, my grandchildren one day will walk in the fullness and return. And God will keep his promise, and they will seek him with their whole hearts, and he'll be right there waiting for them, even though we have to sit through this time. I, I don't know about you, but most people I know can't sit through a couple hours or a couple days or a couple weeks of, of not getting immediate feedback that I'm okay, you're okay, let's do a Barney Purple Dragon hug, right? We're that caught up in our need for immediate feedback that God is right there giving us what we're asking for. And, and the thing is, can we persevere by being faithful because we trust that he is faithful, that we can see striving in that moment of trying to make our lives work for us because God did not send his son to make your life work out for you according to your design. But that's what we've turned Christianity to. We've turned Christianity into this thing of, hey, if I come to Jesus, then he can help me make my life work out for me in a way that really blesses me. And that's not the point at all. In fact, it distorts the point to the point of perversion. God is faithful. You want to you understand God's faithfulness? You understand the promise of God? Read the book of Deuteronomy, fifth book of the Old Testament. Powerful book. I'm just going to read you a quick section here. So, Deuteronomy 4, 29 to 31. Moses said to the Israelites, that you guys are going to live such, in such a way that you're going to invoke the promises of God. <sighs> Honestly, if you read Deuteronomy, what Moses was saying is you're going to, he said, you're going to live in such a way as to invoke the curses. You will be cut off. So listen to this. Deuteronomy 4, 29 to 31. But from there you will seek the Lord your God. From there being from the place of being cut off, 
from that place, just like Jeremiah 29 here, from that place, you will then seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and your soul. When you are in distress and all these things have come upon you, when all the judgments of God have come upon you, when you have been cut off from the land, when you are in dire straits, when you're in the worst possible place, in that time, cry out to God. And he says, in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and listen to his voice. For the Lord your God is a compassionate God. He will not fail you nor destroy you nor forget the covenant with your fathers which he swore to them. This is such a profound truth. A brother of mine sent me an email in response to to this sermon. And he said, it reminded him of the time when the Israelites, when Moses, and they had their back against the sea. And here's Pharaoh and and the Egyptian army and all their chariots coming, approaching them. And and, and Moses is like, we got to wait upon the Lord. But he's going to rescue us and deliver us. And there was nothing there for people by their eyes to say, how in the world is God going to rescue us from the most powerful military in the world? And what do you do? He ended up splitting the sea for them. But can you imagine living in that place where you have the, the most powerful military in the world coming up against you and your back is literally against the wall, against the sea. You've got nowhere to go. And your leader is like, I got this. Actually, I don't got it. I got nothing. But God's got it. We would fire that president and get us a new one. I'm not talking about any current president issues. I'm just saying you would fire that pastor. You would fire that business owner if they didn't take action and get a fix. We don't value this in America. We do not value waiting upon the Lord and trusting that he's actually going to show up. So I am trying to simply soberly say we are a people of action and it's gotten us where we are and there's good and bad to that. But the reality is, friends, as, brother, as Christians... We are called to hope in the Lord. We are called to wait upon God. We are called to seek him because his solution is greater than ours. His ways are greater than ours. His thoughts are greater than ours. And even when our back is against the wall and even when everything looks like it's failing and even when we question those in responsibility over us, that's not the time to blow up the thing. It's the time to wait upon God. But sometimes we let our cultural anxiety get the best of us and we just go to action. We go to making it work got to trust God. God's going to show up. <laughs> and I've got to do the last point. I can't leave you hanging. Okay, I'm trying to be sensitive to your well-being. <laughs> All the promises of God are yours in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 1.20. Check that one out. Okay, the fourth point. Jeremiah says this. Jeremiah says this weird statement at the end of this little thing, in verse 27, Lamentations 3, 27, he says, it is good for a man that he should bear the yoke in his youth. Here's your fourth point. You hope in the Lord, you wait upon the Lord, you seek the Lord with your whole heart, and here's the fourth point. You get in the yoke of Jesus. We are to get in the yoke of Jesus. The yoke of if you, not yolk, like egg yolk. That's Y-O-L-K. This is yoke, Y-O-K-E, okay? So the yoke is like that which connects two oxen together to work, okay? It's the yoke imagery, agricultural imagery. The yoke in the Old Testament and the New Testament represents this thing. It's called a crossroads. The yoke represents you're either in the yoke of covenant faithfulness to God, You're either choosing to live in God's faithfulness or you're not. You're choosing to live in a yoke of rebellion, slavery. The New Testament uses yoke this way. The the New Testament and the Old Testament use the yoke the same way. Jesus used the yoke this way. This is what yoke means beyond its agricultural imagery. It's an image of who are you serving. Okay, and this is exactly what Jeremiah is doing. In fact, the, the, the tradition of Jeremiah is rich with yoke imagery. If you haven't read the book of Jeremiah in a while, so much yoke imagery. And here he is in Lamentations using it. I want you to hear Matthew eleven twenty 20 to 28, where Jesus uses the yoke imagery. And I want you to hear that Jesus is actually using the yoke in the same way that Jeremiah is using it here. So Matthew 11, verses 20 to 28. Okay, such a powerful... We're heading to Jesus now. How does Jesus bring this all together for us? Here we go. Then he began, then Jesus, meek and mild Jesus. I always love 
emphasizing our views of Jesus when I read passages like this. Then Jesus began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum. Capernaum was a city Jesus had made his, his uh, base of operations. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. Hades is a word for hell, a, way, a place of death. You'll be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, you know Sodom, Sodom, Gomorrah? You, haven't, you don't have to have ever been in church to know what Sodom, Gomorrah story. Uh, for if the mighty works been done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you, Capernaum. Bam! Meek and mild Jesus, let them have it. Okay, verse 25. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Bold truth from Jesus' lips. Verse 28, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus was denouncing the Jewish people for their break of covenant faithfulness with God. That's what Jesus was doing in verses 20 to 25. He's listing all these cities. He's, he's pronouncing judgment over them. He is saying all the promises of God are yours in Christ Jesus. Judgment, because you have rejected me. We have totally like neutered the power of Jesus in modern Christian views of Christ. This is a powerful passage. A strong, bold move of the Spirit upon Jesus to do a prophetic judgment over those who had rejected him and lived in apostasy, a lack of faithfulness to God. This is Jesus. But then the Spirit of God moves upon him in a movement of graciousness. He prays to his Father. He acknowledges his Father. And he acknowledges who he is in the Father. And then he gives them an invitation to come to him. All you who are weary and being crushed by life, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me and I'll give you rest for your soul. And by the way, that, and you'll find rest for your souls is a quote of Jeremiah 6.16. So there is an intimate, Jesus is quoting from the prophet Jeremiah in the middle of using yoke imagery that was intimately connected to the prophet Jeremiah. Jesus is calling to mind the Jewish audience's intimate knowledge of the prophet of Jeremiah. We don't see that. They did. They knew what he was doing. We're the ones who miss it. And they know that they deserve the promises of God. But unlike us, they know that means judgment. Because they know they're being called to a crossroads when Jesus says, take my yoke. Because what he's saying is if you don't get in my yoke and learn from me how to be gentle and humble in heart, how to be submissive to the Father, then you're going to remain in covenant rebellion, in unfaithfulness, in an apostate, separated state from God, and you will perish. And then this is explained in John chapter 3. Jesus says in John chapter 3, verses 16 to 22, a very famous scripture followed by a less quoted scripture. <laughs> I love how we do that. We do it all the time. We cherry pick from the Bible, quote something, take it out of context, and claim it as our individualistic little power verse. Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. But listen to this. He who does not believe has been judged already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light, Jesus, has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light. Just like the people of Israel back in Jeremiah's day, they loved their own ways greater than they loved God's ways. And it's the same true today. 
People want to live their lives their own way. And they want a smorgasbord approach to life and spirituality. And I'll take a little bit of that, a little bit of that, a little bit of that. But that's not covenant faithfulness to God. Covenant faithfulness to God is a full course meal, wholeheartedly. It's dwelling in his hymn. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Wow. See, this yoke imagery which Jesus is giving us is the crossroads of judgment. Either way, God's promises are yours in Christ Jesus. (laughs) And you're never going to hear that again the same, are you? All the promises of God are yours in Christ Jesus. All means all. Blessings and curses are yours in Christ Jesus, depending upon what you do with Christ Jesus. Because those who believe in his name and put their trust in him will reap all the blessings of God. For he has taken upon himself all the curses. But for those who will not believe in his name, then all the curses of God are yours fully in Christ Jesus. You're at a crossroads this morning. The crossroads of heaven or hell. A crossroads of judgment. Either way, God will be faithful to his promise because he is faithful and true. That's who he is. Choose this day whom you will serve. And know that your lifestyle declares to the world and to God the truth of the decision you make. The question is not whether God is faithful. The question is whether you will be faithful. Jesus Apart from you, we can do nothing. We need your grace and your Holy Spirit to come upon us now. We have heard of your great hope. We have been instructed to wait upon you rather than taking matters into our own hands. We have been instructed to seek you with our whole hearts and to live according to your commandments. And now we have been put at a crossroads. We have been put at a place of decision. All the promises of God are ours in Christ Jesus. Blessings and curses. I pray for you if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you have not put your hope in him, if you have not weighed upon him, if you have not sought him with your whole heart, if you have not gotten into his yoke to learn from him, then do it today. Pray this prayer, Jesus. I believe that you are God. And I need to get in your yoke, your ways, your life. Forgive me for trying to live life my own way. And teach me to live life your way. Forgive me of my sins. I believe. Help me with my unbelief. In Jesus' name, amen.